Now, the next thing that we need to explore then is what do we do with this data that we're getting from our sensors and how do we communicate with actuators? And it comes down to control systems. A system is any unit that receives input and produces output, right? The unit has some type of internal processing or actions. They may be hidden or undefined for the user. We don't really care. We just want the output that we want. So think of a, a water filtration system that you might use in your home. You know that there's unfiltered water going in and filtered water coming out. You're not necessarily concerned about the exact type of filters as long as it meets some purification specification that you desire. And so the key then is that the system itself just does its job. It takes the input, gives you the output, and it's up to you to pick the right system that gives you the right output. Control then is constraining the system based on variables. So for example, I may have a water filtration system that can run the water through one cycle or two cycles or three cycles, and it gives me a different level of output. So I might have a kind of control that simply says run it through two cycles, or I might measure the output and change the number of cycles depending on the quality of water that I'm getting on the output. And so one of those would be an open loop system and the other would be a closed loop. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. There are three categories of control that are commonly referred to. Uh, controlling variables, sequences, or event occurrence. So when we're controlling variables, we're controlling things like temperature, pressure, flow level, size of machined objects, weight, all of these kinds of things. So we're simply controlling those variables, like the temperature of a liquid or the temperature in some type of a heating system, the pressure within a pipe or the pressure within a container, etc. Controlling sequences is about moving something to a location, possibly doing something there, moving it to another location, doing something there, maybe discarding things that are detected to be faulty. This would be controlling sequences, so actions that take place in a flow, in a sequence, commonly done in manufacturing environments. And then controlling event occurrence is simply based on some variable. We either have an action that we're going to take or not take. So these are the three common categories. Not everything fits nicely into just one of these categories. Sometimes it's all three. Sometimes it's two of them. Sometimes it's just one of them. And you may run into some things that don't fit as nicely into these categories. But these are the three common categories of control. When it comes to control, as I've already alluded to, we have open loop and closed loop control. So open loop control is just take an action based on some variable. So, so take this action based on the laws of the system. We know, for example, that if the temperature is currently 60 degrees in a room and we want it to be 65 degrees, then we're going to need to run the heater for X amount of time based on the way that system has worked. So we can simply say, turn on the heater for this amount of time. So we have the input of an amount of time. We have a timer that simply says, open the flow. So maybe this is a liquid process in this case. And then we keep it open for that amount of time and then we close it. And we know the container is filled based on the flow amount that goes through per second. And therefore, if we have a timer that opens the flow for a certain number of seconds, we'll get a particular size container filled, right? So the laws of the system dictate that I can use, in this case, an open loop control because I know what it's going to do. But what if I have many different containers that might be coming down the line? In that case, I want a closed loop control. We're going to take action for X, monitor the input, and adjust X. So we're going to take an action, possibly for some defined amount of time, but we may adjust that time on the fly based on what's happening. We may cut it off early. We may run it longer. We may not even have a specified amount of time. We may simply say, open the flow until I tell you to close it. And so the controller has communications with a sensor and an actuator. The sensor is evaluating how full the container is. And then based on it reaching a level that we consider full, 12 ounces, 20 ounces, 200 ounces, whatever it is, we send a signal back to the controller how full it is. And then the controller, when it gets to the condition we call full, simply sends the actuator command to close the flow. And now the container is filled. So one of them, fixed size container, fixed amount of flow, the law of the system tells me I can do it for a certain amount of time. The other one, variable size containers, unfixed amount of uh, fluid then, and I need to simply open the flow until it's full and then close the flow. 
And many different types of sensors could be used to accomplish this. Now, this is a general concept. Whether you're using open loop or closed loop is going to, of course, depend on the system that you're using. One of the most common types of controllers that we use is called a programmable logic controller or a PLC. Another is an RTU that's similar to it. Um, we will talk about remote terminal units or remote telemetry units or whatever you want that acronym to stand for briefly a little later on and compare them with PLCs. A PLC then is a computer-based controller. It was born in 1970. Um, the, the legend tells us that an individual was coming off of a hangover and he got the idea. So maybe that tells us about some ways in which ideas are born. But at any rate, it's a computer-based controller. It has simplified programming logic. So you don't have to be a master programmer to program them, but you do have to learn some kind of programming. It may be reprogrammed by engineers for different tasks. So you can load a different program to do different things. And then it may participate in a PLC network with supervisory PLCs and local PLCs. So supervisory PLCs are monitoring and controlling local PLCs, which are monitoring and controlling sensors and actuators. Many network types exist. I'm not going to get into the details of all of them. There are well over a dozen different common types of networks used for PLCs, RTUs, DCSs, and so forth. And computer networks can be used to connect the PLC to the enterprise network. So if you want to get data out of the PLC, there may be a module available for the PLC that allows it to send that data back to some centralized system. It might be a SCADA system or it might be some other custom developed system. The PLC itself is typically programmed with a language called ladder logic, but they also do sometimes use function blocks borrowed from the DCS world and other worlds. We'll not get into the details of programming languages and so on today. So this gives you an idea of what a PLC really is made of on the inside. Of course, there's a power supply so that it can function. There's a computer in there. And then it has input modules and output modules. So on the input modules, it's receiving information from sensors. And then the output modules, it can be communicating with actuators. So the PLC can both monitor and control if so configured. And the input modules and output modules, they'll vary depending on what kind of systems you're talking to and what kind of information you need to gather. Another system we have is the distributed control system or DCS. And this is also sometimes called a decentralized control system. It was born a little later in 1975. And the goal was to allow for multi-system control compared to PLCs at the time. So back in the 1970s, PLCs, were really kind of one-off units. This PLC controls this system. This one controls this other system. And there's really no communication between the PLCs or centralized management of them at first. So in 1975, the concept of a DCS was born saying we need this integrated control center, this single point of control, what we in IT nowadays call a single pane of glass, right? So one place to go in order to manage and control all of this. DCS is often considered better for safety than PLCs because of single vendor implementation. And then other people say PLCs are better for safety because it's faster in response time. So it's a debate that does go on. DCS is used in large scale implementations. And that's the historical view of it. But things are changing a little bit. So the lines are blurred. Many PLC implementations can do most or all that a DCS can do, and many DCS implementations implement more rapid response times. So, yeah, some of it's a little challenging today. The general guidelines, and this comes from Automation World, a great resource for information about industrial automation. Um, they recommend that PLCs are generally faster and more suitable for time-sensitive applications, and generally that does still hold up. Remember, they're usually localized, right? They're not communicating back with a center system for control, so they're closer to the edge. DCSs are generally more scalable, although, again, that's getting blurred these days with what we can do with PLCs, especially with SCADA systems. DCSs are generally more cost-effective for redundancy because it's often built in, whereas with PLCs, we're implementing a second PLC, and, and then we're implementing a supervisory PLC to manage them, and it, it gets a little bit more complicated sometimes. And then PLCs are simpler for small-scale deployments. So if you just have one or two systems you need to control, PLCs are usually much easier to implement for that kind of system. And they're best for consistent processes, where DCSs are best for variable processes. But again, that's the historical view. This has changed a lot with some of the programmability that's available today for both of these systems. And then we have this thing you might have heard of called a SCADA system, Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. 
very commonly used in oil and gas, electrical power supply, and industrial manufacturing. It collects and examines processing data in real time, and it logs that data for analysis and review. So these are the two big things that it does for us. And it does this based on its communications with hardware and software. So it communicates with those PLCs we just talked about, or possibly remote terminal units. Now, this is another area where there used to be huge differences between PLCs and RTUs. And it's not as big of a difference nowadays. Uh, but the biggest area of difference is mostly in the build. So today, RTUs offer improved environmental tolerances. So if you're in a hostile environment, meaning weather conditions or temperature conditions and same, things like that, RTUs may be manufactured to better handle that type of environment. Um, they often provide modules to control specific units as well. So there are custom modules that control specific types of sensors, actuators, or systems, and it makes it easier to implement that. And they may offer more languages. It's not uncommon for RTUs to be programmed through C Sharp, Basic. Um, I've even seen a couple that supported Python. And so there are ways to program them other than the more traditional ladder logic and function blocks and so on. So all this data from the hardware is aggregated into the SCADA software system. And then the SCADA software system can communicate with the PLCs and RTUs, possibly in some cases reprogramming them, but certainly monitoring them and taking all that data and centralizing it so that you have monitoring and controlling of very large sites or even multiple sites. One of the big selling points of SCADA initially was remote control. Rather than having to be on site, I could be at a different location and actually manage those systems and environments. So this gives you a visual idea of what SCADA components might look like. We have here our PLCs, and they're connected to sensors, actuators, other things. There's a SCADA master that aggregates all of this data together. And then there's an operator workstation that communicates with the SCADA master so that you can see dashboards, you can possibly do some configuration programming, things like that, in order for the system to work. And remember, the SCADA master may be accessed from a remote location. Now, this has been a jet tour of industrial automation concepts. And I already told you it's a big category. So remember those books that I referred to earlier in the webinar, they can be a really good reference. If you do want to go deeper into some of these areas, maybe I've kind of whetted your appetite for what these things are and how they work. But now what we need to do is move on to think about the next phase.